Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You can be seated. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. Just needed for you to see the most beautiful lady in the room. It's very unusual for me to have Cece with me when I travel. I travel so much. She runs our ministry and has so much on her plate. She's very seldom travels, but she has family in this area. So she took advantage of, she didn't really come to hear me. She came to see them. <laughs> I don't have a microphone for you to share. Anyway, I just wanted you to see my bride. Thanks. Sue. And John always is kind. Thank you for those kind words. And I do think this is, you know, I just trust the Lord. You know, when I, I, I'm very careful about my schedule. If you saw it, you wouldn't think so, but I am. And uh, did not, uh, was very aware when this was scheduled, the timing, and, and just thought, yeah. That's a good place for me to be at that point, because I know um, the stand that, that he makes and, and you make. But I, I just felt like this was a good place for me to be because this is a place of prayer. This is a place of faith. We're praying about much more than an election right now. We're praying about the destiny of a nation. And I'll be touching on that in my message uh, quite a bit. Of course, you know, follow me at all. You know that's what has become my assignment for the last 25 to 30 years, and that is to see our nation turn back to the Lord and to uh, recapture our destiny. And I'm going to talk about that destiny today some. Um, but that's what I live for. That's what I'm mantled to do. And uh, we take it very seriously. And, and so it's just good to be here with a, in a place that I know I don't have to work anything up. I don't have to try to convince anybody. I can just get with... I don't know what's here, 800,000 people and thousands more online, and we can just get in agreement right from the start. And that's what I'm here to do. So thank you, John, for your trust and appreciate it greatly. I have known for several years now, three, four, I don't know. Somehow I just knew based on words that were coming to me and what I was sensing in my spirit I've known that 2020 was going to be one of the most significant years of our lives. I, of course, didn't know about COVID. I, God didn't tell me that was coming. I had some friends that had words about that a year or so ago. Uh, but I didn't know about that. I just knew that uh, this year was, was going to be incredibly significant. I started calling it the hinge year because I think everything hinges on what happens this year. We either, we either go through the door that has swung open and finish well, or God forbid, we go back into the wilderness for another 40 years. The good news is I don't see a people and God doesn't need the majority. God has never started with the majority. He always begins with a remnant. And he is never in the minority, by the way. Doesn't matter how many people are against him or demons, he's always the majority.
not only did I know that 2020 would be that this hinge year that it is, but early in this year, maybe even late last year, I began to feel that September and October, and it wasn't just election related. I felt like that September and October would be the hinge months of the hinge year. I knew there was going to be something incredibly um, significant that, that this would this would tell the tale these two months. And I started receiving words from the Lord, both in my heart and from others a few months back, dreams, prophecies, specific dreams about specific dates uh, these two months, and some of those dreams, specific days of the month. I have been in a season where uh, I've not experienced anything like what I ex am experiencing now in the sense that uh, the dreams that are being sent to me by trusted, mature prophets to guide us through this season and my part of this season that has to do with a, a, a portion of the church that listens to me when it comes to praying for the nation and what God's saying. Uh, it's, it's, it's frankly hard to keep up with them. There's rarely a day goes by that I don't receive a significant dream from someone I trust about what God is saying to us right now. Some of them are just in words of encouragement. Some are warnings. Some are, are giving me specific strategies. And it's, it's become so prevalent that, I mean, it's almost, I, I, I feel like sometimes it's like the Lord saying, I don't even trust you to hear when you're awake clearly enough. I'm going to put you to sleep so this thing shuts down. I can just get everything in I want to say. And these people are receiving these, these dreams. And, and so I'm going to share a few of those today. But, but they confirmed to me that this year, the significance of the year and these two months. And I want to say again that even though this election is critical, there's no way to overstate how critical this is. And it's not about Trump. It's not about Republicans, Democrats. It's about the purposes of God in a nation. But, but even though it is as critical as we know it is, what is happening is much bigger than just an election. It's about the destiny of a nation, which is about the destiny of the planet. It is also impossible to overstate how much God needs America right now to turn. When he mantled me for this nation, I was in, it was a several year process. But I had two significant encounters with the Lord that lasted one for an hour, the other for three and a half hours, when he fully mantled me for what I'm doing. And in that second one that lasted the, the longest, he said to me at one point, word for word, literally, when I was on the floor weeping, he said to me, I must have this nation. I must have this nation. For what I am going to do in the earth, in this next season, era, I must have America. That's when I was assigned to give all of my energies and all of my focus toward that process. And it's going, it's going to result, what he's doing, in a third great awakening. Revival's coming. But it's not just a revival for America. It'll be a third great awakening here. It's going to be the first one for a lot of people. The greatest revival, the greatest outpouring of Holy Spirit in the history of the planet we are moving into now. 
A billion, at least a billion souls come into the kingdom. At least a billion, maybe two. <laughs> Nations transformed, portions of the earth transformed. Governments changing. We've never, you've never seen anything. We've never seen anything like what's coming. And he must have this nation to be a part of that. Not only for the gospel, but to hold things steady enough so that the idiots of the world don't take over. The demonized people that have ungodly agendas. So this is a, this is a time like, like never before for us. And one of the dreams sent to me, and this was given to me, I didn't have the dream, but it was sent to me a couple of years ago. And in this dream, a lot, let me just preface this, a lot of these dreams, the, the president comes to me in the dream and talks to me. Most of the time, it's not specifically, it's, it's not necessarily about him, it's about what he represents and his position. So even though I'll, a lot of times if I mention a dream and I'll talk about the president, you just, you just need to know that he, he, it is significant that God deals with him and touches him and we have to pray for him. But the symbolism of the dream is usually bigger than that. And most of these dreams are not, even though I'm in them, they're not specifically about me. They're about what I represent, which is the praying church. The, the, the stream of the body of Christ that is praying and well, it's, it's us. So, so, you know, you could insert your name into the dream is what I'm saying. So you, you need to know that when I mention this, and that's not just an effort to be humble. That's, that's, that's to help you see what God is saying in the big picture. But one of the dreams that was sent to me a couple of years ago, President Trump invited me into the Oval Office and he he thanked me for the prayers that were going on, and he thanked me for the Appeal to Heaven prayer movement. If you don't know what that's all about, you can go to YouTube and find out, or you can order one of my small books called Appeal to Heaven. But most of you have seen the flag. But that flag is associated with our history. Washington commissioned it to fly over the naval vessels and the battlefields of the day because all of the, they all knew that there's no way they could defeat Great Britain and gain independence unless God helped them. If, if, if God didn't do it, it was going to be laughable that they could win. So they did what John Locke said in one of his writings, when you don't know else to do, you appeal to heaven. And so he had a flag created, an appeal to heaven flag with an evergreen tree on it, and it became the banner under which we were born. America was born under a prayer movement. And he, and that has been resurrected in the last few years. And he thanked me for that. And he presented me with, a, with an appeal to heaven flag in this dream, which he had signed, which in the dream is not an autograph to me. It's, a, it's symbolic that the highest office in the land is now endorsing prayer and endorsing this movement. <clears throat> and that that office is now saying, we know the only hope for America is prayer. So then he did some other things in the dream, but then he, he said, can I pray for you? And when he prayed for me, he said, Lord, let, please let this man and these leaders convene a holy convocation that I might finish my eight years well. And I listen, but listen to this phrase. And that the ancient markers of our founding fathers be restored. <laughs> and I'm going to come back to that ancient markers phrase in just a few minutes. 
because I've had probably a dozen different dreams sent to me by these by trusted friends and prophets over the last year or so that either use the phrase ancient markers, ancient boundaries, foundations, purpose, destiny. And again, I'll come back to that in a few minutes, but that, be, that has become very significant. So I determined I will convene a holy convocation. I knew this dream was from God. We prayed about the timing of this, and we landed on October a few weeks ago, 2020. That's before I had heard the words about September and October. And by the way, I looked up the word convocation. It was interesting. His language in the dream was interesting. Holy convocation. He didn't say a conference. He didn't say a prayer gathering. He said a holy convocation. If you look up the word convocation, this is just Wikipedia. Looked up the word convocation. It means a called out assembly. And the, and, the, and the dictionary said it derives, the word is derived from the Greek word ekklesia. The Greek word for church, which doesn't mean this per se, ekklesia, most of you know, the literal meaning of what Jesus said when he said, I'll build my ekklesia, is a legislature, a governing body. That is the only thing it meant when he said it in Greek and, and Rome. It was a called out group of people that became the, the city council, a judicial system. It was legislative. Jesus said, I will have a kingdom government on earth that the gates of hell won't prevail against. And they'll have authority to bind and loose them, giving them keys. The whole passage is about governmental authority. So when he said this in a dream, would you convene a holy ecclesia so that I can finish my eight years well and that the ancient markers be restored? We did that October 8, 9, and 10. We called it the reset because that's what's happening in this nation. God is resetting the nation. Just before the gathering, which was, I'm just, I, I have to say, I've not been a part of anything like that gathering. The, the authority, the presence, the authority, the weight in the room shocked most of us there. We knew that we were there to be an ecclesia that ruled for the king of the kingdom. And it was profound. But a month or so before the gathering, another dream was sent to me. And by the way, in that first one, when he asked me to do the holy convocation for those purposes, he said at the end of the dream, he gave me a pager in the dream, and he said, when you see the number 2222, now, m many of you know that's the verse God used when he called me 25 years ago to do what I'm doing. Isaiah 22, 22, which is fulfilled in Matthew 16. But it, the verse says, he'll give you the key of the house of David, put it on your shoulder, and you'll open doors no one can close and close doors no one can open. And I've used that verse thousands of times around this nation as God has sent me on assignments. Not hundreds, thousands. And almost, I don't know that there's a day that goes by that God doesn't do something supernaturally to put a 22 in front of me. It's either the room I stay in or the clock when I wake up at 222 or the license plate. How does anybody get a license plate that says 2222? I'm not sure. But he said, he gave me a pager and he said, when you see the number 2222, always answer your phone even though there will be no caller ID because it'll be me calling you with prayer requests. And I really didn't ever expect that to happen literally. I just felt like it was just the way that God was saying, I'm going to alert you to, to things to pray about. What has happened, however, 
is that the same man that had that dream has probably had eight or nine dreams since then where the dream begins with me and the number 2222 popping up on my pager. And then my phone rings in the dream and it's the president asking, giving me assignments of how to pray. I'm telling you that I've never been in a season where God has been so determined to orchestrate things the way he needs and wants them done and to let us know without any shadow of a doubt, this is how I need you to pray now. So just a few weeks before that gathering, the reset, one of these dreams came, the pager went off and President Trump spoke to me and he said several things in the dream. But one of the things he said was the dates you have chosen for this are very important and significant. And he started using the meaning of bib numbers biblically. He said, 11, of course, comes after 10, and that's the number of transition. And what is happening now and what you're part of there is, is transitioning the nation into a tipping point. And that's the phrase he used. And then he said, but then 12, of course, comes next. And that's the number biblically of government. And everything that's happening is going to cause the greatest shift in the government of this nation that it's ever experienced. And then he said the highest level of government and governmental authority operating appropriately since, and this is, these were his words, since the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> and then he said this to me, this was, I think, back in September, maybe maybe two months before the meeting, so it might have been August. But he said, the transition, a transition will begin in October. Another dream was sent to me right after this. It's a long dream, don't have time to go into details, but one of the things that was said in that dream was, and that's as a quote, come October, Everything is going to change. Now, I tell you right now, if nothing had happened other than Amy Coney Barrett in October, those dreams would have been true. Because I don't think many of us really fully know, we don't, maybe, maybe you do, maybe you don't, how significant that was. That was the culmination of a 50-year effort to shift that court back where it needs to be. And it's not finished yet, but it's, and 30 years of intercession. And I don't know her, but I know her. And I know what I see on her. She's not only the most, she's not only the smartest one in the room. It was fun to watch. I mean, it was just fun to watch. It was like, I mean, it's like, I miss one to, I didn't know what to do other than laugh when she held up her notepad and there was no notes on it. It was like. But, but, but the point is, she is a godly, spirit-filled, anointed Esther called for such a time as this. And it will not be only her decisions that make a difference. It will be the presence that she carries. It will be such a strong anointing because she's so mantled to do this that her very presence in the room will cause things to change. And every time. Every time she walks in the building, Holy Ghost is coming into that building. And every time she goes in, angels go into that building. She will not only convince other justices, 
about certain things because of her wisdom, they will be influenced by the anointing she carries. And that alone would have made these dreams true about October. Because the greatest curses and the greatest evil that has come into this nation in the last 50 years has come through that court. And that curse is broken. That curse is broken. And I don't have time today. It's not my point. I got to get moving here, but I could tell you about specific assignments and dreams the last two or three months before that all happened that caused some of us to be sitting on the court steps decreeing the things that have now taken place. Back to the ancient markers. Several years ago, the Lord started seeing me in on the importance of our history, things he did in the past, Un unrighteous things that happened in our past, places I need to go and repent and others like me, you know, many have done this for the sins of our past, just like Nehemiah had to do before restoration came and Daniel and others in scripture repent corporately, identificationally for the nation. I did a lot of that because the Lord was saying, you know, I have to heal history. He said, I heal history. I can reach back 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, and, and through the blood of my son, I can cause that. As you repent on behalf of your nation, the curse is broken. And cleansing can come, and now life and covenant blessing can flow through that that, that which used to be a breach of history. And that has happened with me, but that's happened, those kinds of prayers happened countless thousands and thousands of times over about a 10 year period in America in the prayer movement. M millions, I'm gonna say it, millions of prayers have been prayed asking God to forgive us for the sins of abortion, slavery, the way we treated the Native Americans and did things. Those, it's not that God sweeps that stuff under the rug and we're supposed to just say, oh, it doesn't matter. It's that God cleanses. Yes. Somewhere along the line, we have to believe what we preach. Yes. That he cleanses from all sin and unrighteousness. Yes. And it isn't, when it's a corporate sin of a nation, it doesn't have to be the person that did it be repenting. It can be, it can be a group that God brings together that identifies with that, and they're a part of it, and they can say, yes, we repent for the sins of our fathers. Yeah. And that happened, but then he, he began to speak to me and, and, and send me, and I've been to dozens of places in the nation that I feel like are significant regarding God's plans for America and what he was doing just to go and open those wells and say, Lord, return us, restore us. And that was a part of the whole, the whole 12 year journey that had to do with the appeal to heaven message and flag. And he gave me the phrase, the synergy of the ages, because he gave me such revelation that we have to connect with what he was doing back then because what he's doing now is not just for now or not just about now. What he's doing now is also related to what he did then. Every time he came to Isaac and every time he came to Jacob and every time he came to the 12 tribes, he'd always remind them, hey, just this is not about you. This is what I started back then. This goes back to your dad and your granddad. And this goes all the way back to Adam because you, what your granddad, what I called him to do was help me save the world. And so it's all related. And he's beginning to say to me, this awakening that I've put in your heart and this, 
This revival that you know is coming and that you've worked toward is about more than just restoring a nation to blessing and prosperity and even salvation of people. This is about me being able to restore and reset the destiny and purpose of a nation because I must have this nation to do what I want to do and what I, the plans I have for this nation have never changed. And so going back to those who became important and then these dreams started coming about the ancient markers. And, and I've been, as I said, I've been to several. I was still on an assignment with a group of people back in 2016 where Chuck Pierce, who I run with all the time, it's one of the crosses I have to bear. <laughs> Chuck's one of my best friends, so if he was here, I would have still said that. <laughs> he prophesies these prayer assignments on me. Some of them are pretty radical. You know, the charismatic movement, Jesus people movement, we witness to people and we would often start with Jesus loves you and has a plan for your life. Now I say Jesus loves me and Chuck Pierce has a plan for my life. <laughs> if you're watching, those of you out there, you know, welcome to those of you online and YouTube watching us today, we love the fact that you're with us. As far as I'm concerned, this is a national and international yes. prayer meeting and message today. Yes. We're thrilled that you're with us. And if Chuck, if you're watching, I love you, but it's true. <laughs> but a week, you know, right before 2016 elections, he prophesied to me and he said, uh, the Lord says, get a team together and go to the seven places in America that, that progressive represent places where covenant with him was established in America and reconnect us to those covenants. This can't be done just from a one-time journey. You see, God can bring a word like that because of 25 years of intercession. And these things happen as a process. And then you get to a certain point of cleansing, prayer, God working, doing this and that. And then suddenly he can say, now I can do this. Go snap it into place. Go prophesy. Go do this. And so he said, go. And Chuck prophesied six of the seven places. And I knew what the seventh one was. And we went to Cape Henry. And we went to Jamestown. We went to Plymouth. We went to Boston. We went to Philadelphia. We went to York. We went to D.C. He gave me, I had a week to put that together. I called a bunch of friends and I said, whoever wants to go, this is what we're doing. Take your time, pray about it, let me know tomorrow. <laughs> but I knew it was about the ancient markers. It was about reconnecting to what he said back then. Because our destiny has been in jeopardy and, yet, and Satan has been trying to steal from us our destiny our purpose in him so when this year started the same way God sending me on assignments I went during COVID the, the, the peak of it I went to, uh, to Valley Forge because that's where much of the character that's really where the war for independence, our freedom, was really won. What, whichever way Valley Forge went, that's what would happen. And so much was forged there. I took a team there, and God, through a dream, said, go to Valley Forge. But then Cape Henry began to really grab my heart, my mind. And I knew there's something, and I'll tell you about two places now for the remainder of this message. I came to know more and more and more these two places are very significant in the context of our destiny. So Cape Henry, I kept praying. I thought, you know, I feel like I even need to go there before this reset meeting. 
And then a friend of mine said, I have a dream. I had a dream about you I need to tell you about. One of my spiritual sons. He said, it's a short dream, but you came to see me in the dream, but I was at my dad's house. You came to my dad's house. He said, you walked up to me and you could see my dad in the yard, running around the yard in a superhero costume, wearing a cape. I love dreams because God can, he can just do weird stuff to give you messages, you know. Most of you are weird anyway. You wouldn't be here. <clears throat> I know I'm weird. But I looked at him and I said, his dad's name is Ike. Call him, that's what we call him. I didn't know it wasn't his real name. And in a dream, I looked at him and I said, why is Ike running around the yard in a superhero costume wearing a cape? And he looked at me in the dream and he said, that's not Ike, that's Henry. And then he told me as he was relating the dream, he said, my dad's real name is Henry. So then he looked at me and he said, that was the end of the dream. And he said, I think maybe God's talking to you about Cape Henry. And I said, as a matter of fact, he is. Was there anything else? He said, no. So I talked to the Lord about it. I said, well, obviously you're talking to me about Cape Henry, but what's the, why did you do it this way? What's the superhero thing? And what's the, <clears throat> the Cape thing? And here's what I heard the Lord say. The supernatural power, that's what superheroes have. In the movie world, no, you know, he said the supernatural power needed to overcome evil. That's what they do. Will be found at Cape Henry, the place where your destiny was established. What I'm about to read to you, I already knew. But it has grown in me in significance. There's no place where what God's plan was and the reason he raised up America. There's no place where that was decreed and laid out any more clearly than at Cape Henry in 1607 when the group of pilgrims landed there under the leadership of Robert Hunt. It was a difficult journey. It took a lot longer, months longer than they had, it, had thought it would take. It's about a hundred plus of them. A lot of sickness, a lot of adversity. One of them actually died en route. It was, it was difficult. But even though they were months longer and the difficulty they had when they reached land, Robert Hunt would not let them disembark immediately. He said, we are not going ashore until we fast and pray for three days. He knew somehow the holy significance of what was happening. He knew that this was about more than just some people trying to get out from under an evil king or find some new lands or the, those are part of the group that were there as merchants to, to find wealth. He knew something else was, was, this was about something else. So after they prayed and fasted for three days, they went ashore and he took the cross that he had brought with him from England and he put the cross on the beach. He put a cross right there in the sand. And he offered a lengthy prayer. Here's part of it. 
We do hereby dedicate this land and ourselves to reach the people within these shores with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And to raise up godly generations after us. And with these generations, take the kingdom of God to all the earth. Most of you, unless you've heard a person like myself say it, most of you would not know that. They're not going to teach it in school, public school. That the decree that went forth into the atmosphere over this nation when they put their feet there and planted that cross said that the purpose of this nation is to take the gospel of the kingdom to all the nations of the earth. <laughs> and then he said, may this covenant of dedication May this covenant of dedication remain to all generations as long as this earth remains. And may this land, along with England, be evangelist to the world. And may all who see this cross remember what we have done here. And may those who come here to inhabit join us in this covenant. And I said, Lord, I think, I think I have to go back. I've been there before, but I think I have to go back after this dream and what was in my heart. It was like, I don't know if you can, if you can understand what I'm saying, but it's like Cape Henry was calling to me. It's just like, I have to go. I have to go. I don't always know when that happens, what it's, what, what am I going to do when I get there? I just sometimes know it's like, I have to go. I'm praying about it. And as I'm thinking, praying, I think I'm supposed to go. My friend Clay Nash sent me a dream. You know, Clay's been walking as a prophet for probably 30 plus years, but he didn't start dreaming. Listen to this. Talk about the significance of the ancient wells and connecting with the past. He really didn't start being a the dreaming prophet. He can't sleep now. He dreams all the time. He's the one that gave me the dream where, where the president said, convene the holy convocation that I could finish well in the ancient market store. He gets these dreams. He sends them to me weeping. He's just overcome. But his dreaming started at Cape Henry on the retrace tour that Chuck prophesied that I go to the seven cities and reconnect covenant. When he prayed there at the covenant well of Cape Henry, God opened to him a new dimension of the prophetic in his life. And he sent me this dream. See, I dreamed the morning of September 9th. That's a month before reset. Dutch, that you issued a call to to a few, a small group to go with you to Cape Henry. You, you instructed that we were to fast and pray before we went, just as the initial people did, and consecrate ourselves to the Lord. In the dream we obeyed, and then I said, we can go, we can go now and put our feet there. There's a, there's, a, there's a cross there at Cape Henry that's a memorial to what happened can't get to the cross right now because it's on a military base and because of COVID they've shut down but you can still get to the beach which we don't know exactly where they came ashore that's that's all I needed was to get to the beach strategy came to us through dreams in this in this dream before we went ashore one of those strategies I have not done yet but I will be doing Then I said, this, I'm going to read this as a quote. Then you said we were ready to set foot on the land at the cross and see the well of oaths, O-A-T-H-S, oaths, opened and freed to flow across America. Now let me pause here and say, God knew that phrase, 
the well of oaths would be incredibly significant to me. The Hebrew word is Beersheba. And the place Beersheba means the well, Pierre, of oaths, Shiva. Or the well of covenant, because the word oath and covenant were interchangeable. Because in a covenant ceremony, they repeated an oath of covenant seven times. So in Hebrew, the word seven and oath are the same because that act of covenant was called sevening yourself or taking an oath of covenant. This is the place, for those of you that go back far enough with me, this is the place where Abraham, at the end of his 25-year journey, after he had fought through the wavering and Ishmael and lying about his wife and saying, she's my sister, because he didn't want the king to kill him to get her. He didn't start out as an unwavering man of unwavering faith. He started out just as flaky as most of us did. But God saw something in him because he sees the end from the beginning. And he saw something deeper than the man's weaknesses. And when he walked him through all that and got him to the point where he said, he's not the covenant breaker with his wife and he's not the liar. And he's not the guy that slept with his wife's maid. That's not who I see him as. Because when I cleanse something, I cleanse it. And that's not how I remember him. And the, and the rest of the scriptures don't call him the covenant breaker. He's the father of faith. He's a friend of God. And at the end of this journey, when Isaac is there now, and this transformed man, who's going to partner with God to save the planet? Plants an evergreen tree, which is a symbol of covenant. That when he planted that tree, and you could read the history of the tamarisk tree, slow growing, goes deep, the best shade tree in all of, all of the land, but grows so slowly that when you plant one, the benefit of that tree will never benefit you, but only the generations that follow you. And the planting of that evergreen tree was a statement by Abraham. When he called on everlasting God, planting an evergreen, it was his statement that I am forever in covenant with this God. I will forever serve him and his purposes. And it was saying to the generations that follow that would sit under tamarisk trees in the heat of the day for shade. It was a statement to them. He was saying, you will, to his kids and his grandkids and his great grandkids, you will sit under the shade of my covenant with God. That place where he planted that tree, which was a part of the appeal to heaven message, the dream God gave me of taking out giants, you're going to have to walk in the revelation of covenant, evergreen, and who I am as everlasting God. I'm bigger than your failures. When I called you, I knew you were going to fail, but I knew I could get you to here. And he said, if America is going to overcome the giants in this season, you're going to have to get back to that covenant place with me. And you're going to have to believe, you and intercessors are going to have to believe that I'm bigger than the sins of your past. Because I did not call you based on your worthiness. And I don't use you based on your worthiness. I called you based on my faith and what I can do through the blood of my son. And it's not about you. And you just go ahead and repent for those past sins and I'll wipe them away. And I know, we've, I know how many babies we've aborted. 
And I know about the sins of our past in other areas. But I know that the blood of Jesus is greater than all of that. And he said to me in a dream, if you wear those two gloves, you can take out the giants. Now, that's not a bunny trail. That act took place at Beersheba, the well of oaths. So did Isaac's connection to that covenant journey with God in Genesis 26. Abraham's was Genesis 21. Isaac's Genesis 26. God took him back to the well of oath. And that's where he finally made that connection. God actually made me go to Beersheba, literally, during this appeal to heaven journey. He said, I don't want you to just preach about Beersheba. I don't want you to just read about it in Scripture. I need you to go there and stand on that ground. I need you to stand at that well and, and drink spiritual water from that spiritual well and tap into the revelation I need because I'm going to get America back to Beersheba. He said to me, John. And when God said to me in this dream, when he said, go there so that the well of oaths can be freed and flow once again to this nation, I knew exactly what he was saying. He was saying, Cape Henry is your Beersheba. It's your well of covenant. I took a team. We did just that. It was a profound two hours on that beach. But here's what else happened in the dream. When we arrived, this is before we actually went there. This is still the dream. When we arrived at Cape Henry, the cloud of witnesses appeared in the dream. And why not? A lot at stake for them. They appeared in the dream. And from that cloud of witnesses, Reese Howell stepped forward. And for those of you that are not aware, watching or here today, one of the greatest intercessors that's ever lived. You can read his book, Reese Howells, Intercessor. A classic. But most historians and theologians will say to you that it was Reese Howells and his team of intercessors that saved the world during World War II. But for 12, 15, 18 hours a day, they would travail in intercession. And Churchill said once when Reese and his company pray, we win. And God started giving them plans and battles to pray over before the battles ever happened and before anybody in the militaries even knew the battle was going to take place. Before some of those battles took place, Reese Howes and his intercession or his intercessors had already prayed it through. He stepped forth from the cloud of witnesses. And he prayed over us. He prayed about, he said, Lord, in this season, help them to plow deep. So that the seeds of revival that are coming can do all that they need to do. And then he started praying about the plowman overtaking the reaper that the harvest would be so great and so fast, praying that we would be able to keep up with what God was about to do. Then he took his coat off and placed it on my shoulders in the dream. And it wasn't about me. 
It was about us. And his statement it makes that very clear. It's what I represent. It's who I represent. And in the dream, he said, this is the coat I wore during World War II. Let me paraphrase that. This is the mantle I carried. This is the anointing that we warred under. And it must be worn by the ecclesia in this day in order to see the kingdom harvest that is at hand. He then hugged me in the dream like a father would a son. Picture one of the great patriarchs of the faith and of the last century wrapping his arms around this movement and saying, come on, guys, you can do this. Come on, you can do this. And he said the following words. The training is finished. It's time to go to war. And October, we'll see the turning of the war. He held up a scroll with a wax seal. And he said, this seal will be broken in October. And the words from it will be activated. And will release a holy awe. I can can tell you without an ounce of doubt that well of covenant is now open once again and flowing into this nation. Now let me mention one more place. And I'm going to be quick. I'm watching the clock. It's my goal to get us out of here by noon. We might not make it, but I think we will. (laughs) John was gracious to get me up quickly so I could have all the time I needed. There's another place that I want to mention. Let me start by <clears throat> saying I've been to Philadelphia many times. I've prayed there numerous times. But a dream was sent to me about a year ago. Well, not quite a year ago, last December. Sometimes these dreams come to me way in advance, and I find myself praying over these things, revisiting them, thinking about them for months, John was a part of the assignment on my life is to, is to spend enough time doing that to tap into the timing and the, the details of the strategy. But in this dream, it was really a dream about my life, our, our journey. And I was climbing a rope, a long rope in the dream. And along the way, there were knots tied. And each knot had a year on it. First was 1978. It's an incredible detailed dream. And in the dream, these places were, these were years and times in that year when I would get tired or God was needing to do something significant to get me ready for the next phase of the journey. There were places I could stop, stand on that knot and rest. 
<clears throat> there were nine of those as we thought back through looked at those from 78 the next one was 86 1986 and we thought and we went back in our minds we we knew what every year stood for the last 2019 and then even though I was tired in the dream could barely do it there was a bell at the top and it was the Liberty Bell and on it in the dream it said the United States of America 2020 Isn't that fascinating that I've been on a journey to get me to this place in 2020? And we are tired. And I thank God for those stops. But in the dream, I reached up, grabbed the rope hanging, I rang the bell. In 2020. And she said, even though it was weak, this dream, the sound was loud and it reverberated across the nation. And it was so loud that it created movement in the atmosphere. And people ran out of their houses, government buildings, schools, buildings, everywhere, looking for the sound and the movement. And at the end of the dream, The Lord spoke from that atmosphere, and he said, America, now that I have your attention, you've been saved by the bell. Now. That, of course, fascinated me because you, or you've been saved, yeah, saved by the bell, not the ringing, but saved by the bell. And my thought was, Lord, you know, I, I know the play on words of saved by the bell. I know what it means in boxing. I know what it meant in history, how different, different things about that phrase. But I, I, but I knew there's something more because it was the Liberty Bell. And how could we be saved by that? And then, of course, as I meditated over and prayed over this, it became clear and clear to me why he chose that symbol in the dream. Because it's because of what's on the Liberty Bell. And you weren't taught this in history either. Some of you know it. There's a verse of scripture on that bell. And the verse is Leviticus 25.10. Proclaim liberty throughout the land to all the inhabitants thereof. And that verse is in the passage that describes the year of Jubilee. Which for those of you that haven't, <clears throat> haven't been taught about it or haven't maybe... Maybe you haven't even known the Lord all that long. You would don't know the Bible that well. But that was every, every 50 years in Israel. There was a great reset. And in 50 years, everything basically started over. All debt was forgiven. Everybody that was an indentured slave or servant, if you couldn't pay your debt, you'd... you'd you, know, you, owe, you owe this person a certain amount of money, you'd say, I will serve you for the next three years. You became an indentured servant. They were freed at Jubilee. Any land that had been bought or sold went back to the original family that owned it at the year of Jubilee. 
So they had to even prorate things. Because you're going to buy a piece of land, you're not going to pay full price for it. You only get it for a year if it's the 49th year. So everything was prorated and everything had to, everything had to be done with Jubilee in mind. So Jubilee was a great celebration because it was a fresh start for everybody. And that all happened not only because it was God's way of resetting things in the nation every 50 years. But it was a picture that he created of the cross and Christ who became our jubilee. And the New Testament says Christ our jubilee. Who paid the debt so that we could go free? Who forgave us all of our debt? Everything's returned, restored through Christ, our Jubilee. So that verse on the bell, it's not just, it's not just about a group of people that want freedom from a king. It's not just about liberty in the sense we think of it. It's a verse in the Bible that announces the redemption of humankind through the blood of Jesus at the cross and the sound that went out into the atmosphere of this nation on our birth date was that we are to be a company of people. We are the Jubilee sound. We are to announce his freedom and his liberty and his forgiveness to the ends of the earth, to all the inhabitants thereof. That's what we were born under. That's what he announced over us on, our day, on the day of our birth. And God said to me, I'm resetting this nation. And I've opened the well at Cape Henry, and I need for you to go to decree at the Liberty Bell that we are moving back into the Jubilee Company, declaring the message of the gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the earth. And that destiny will not be stolen forever. We're moving back into it. We are being restored. We are being renewed, recalibrated, reconstituted, and reset. And I, I, I know I'm weird, but just like Cape Henry, the bell started calling me. Deep down here, I got to go back. And I felt I need to go before the election. Schedule was full. Didn't know when I could do it in a conference I was scheduled to be in. The church had a breakout of COVID and they canceled. And I said, I think that's my window. I said, Lord, do you want me to go? And my friend Clay Nash had another dream. And in the dream, the president came to us weeping. So what God has planned for this nation must not be aborted. He said, would you pray for me? And we did, and he sat and wept in the dream. And then he looked at me. He said, I need you to take the appeal to heaven flag. The picture's covenant and appealing to Olam, everlasting God. Which is what Abraham did at Beersheba. And what God called Cape Henry. And the flag George Washington commissioned. 
And he said in the dream, I need you to take the appeal to heaven flag. He said, I, I need for you to take the appeal to heaven flag and I need you to wave it seven times in a figure eight. Seven being a number, not only of completion, but covenant. And eight being the symbol of infinity, eternal covenant. I need you to take that flag and I need you to wave it seven times in a figure eight. And then in the dream, he looked at me, he looked at all of them and he said, and Dutch knows where to do this. And when I read the dream, I knew it was the bell. And I called my daughter and I said, get me to Philadelphia tomorrow. And I called a couple of friends, Clay Nash, Ken Malone. I said, I'm going to go by myself. I usually take a team for some reason on this journey. I just felt like I needed to be by myself. But I knew I needed help. So I said, can you please be available so that I can call you when I'm there? And by phone, we can agree together. <clears throat> and we did, and I did. It was hard for me to talk on the phone because I felt like I was about to birth something I've been carrying for 25 years. We decreed that America, through Jubilee, through Christ and his shed blood on the cross, has been reset to her calling to be the trumpet of that message to the ends of the earth. And that was that, and I went home. That was a Saturday. And most of you have seen what I'm about to show you, parts of it anyway. Because the very next day, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm so sorry when I cry like this. This stuff gets messed up. Plus, I've been speaking so much, but... The next day, the man who in the dream told me to take that flag and wave it seven times and decree reset, that's what I knew in my heart. President Trump went to Las Vegas and went to church. He likes that church. He's been there three times. I've been there three or four times. I know the pastor as well. He likes it because they're prophetic. They're not seeker. They do full worship set, dance and do other things, but when he's there, and they talk, they don't water things down and they prophesy to him. And he likes it, you know, and they raise their hands and he stands there and goes, And pictures started, started going viral. And then this picture was sent to me, if we can get it up now. Now, I don't know how well you can see this, but the pastor at one point unfolded an appeal, appeal to heaven flag. I haven't talked to any of these people. They don't know nothing about what I did the day before. They don't know anything about it. 
He unfolds his flag and starts talking about it to the president. And I know that in the back, you probably can't see this. But over the pastor's head, you can see that, the word reset. And somehow, somehow, I don't think in a thousand years you could stage this. Somehow that reflection started going around and God put the word reset right on the president's back. You can't make that up. You can't make that up. With the same flag and the very word, and he wrote it on the president's back. Reset. We are standing at a point in history that is as significant for this nation and the nations of the earth as any other time in the last 400 years. God is preparing, setting the table, setting the stage for the greatest outpouring of Holy Spirit in history. And I'm going to say again what I said to you at the beginning of this message. He must have America. What he's trying to do is about so much more than yours and my prosperity. I'm thrilled when I hear and can see the economy is going to turn again. And I know Trump can do it with God's help. Our destiny is not to be rich. America's destiny is not to be wealthy, the richest nation in the world. We have to be that to fulfill our destiny. Our destiny is not just, not just to be the biggest and baddest and most powerful. We have to be that so that we can do what he needs in the earth. We got to have this servant heart. That we are called and anointed and ordained and mantled by him for a very specific cause. And whereas Israel, and I would never even hint that we could take the place of that covenant and with Israel. But whereas they were called to birth salvation through the Messiah, we are called to be the trumpet of that message to the ends of the earth. And he's going to get this done. We're in a Psalm 2 moment. Where the rulers of this earth, many of them, take counsel together. Psalm 2 happens every day in Washington now. They take counsel together against he and his anointed. They don't know he's listening. They have no fear of God. But he's listening. And their decree is, he will not rule over us. And what I think is probably the most horrifying sound 
that could ever be issued. It says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. It's a laugh of derision. It's a laugh of mocking laugh toward their rebellion. It's heaven's way of saying, who do you think you are anyway? And he says, this is my son. And I've already promised him, given to him, all the nations of the earth. Every square inch of the planet is his. And then he gives two options. This is where we are, my friend. You're either going to kiss the sun or my scepter of iron is coming to crush you. And I know there have been probably lots of seasons in history. I mean, you factor in the cross and other times that where this, the intensity of God begins to manifest. But I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not sure there's ever been a time when he's been more determined because he's going to get this harvest. He is far more passionate about it than we are. He loves them far more than we do, even our own families. He is passionate about this. His heart is burning with holy passion and zeal. His heart of love is very engaged. And he's rising up as the warrior that he is. He's coming to rescue. He's coming to save. He's coming to redeem. And there is no force. There's no principality. There's no, there's no strategy of hell. There's no government. There's no person that can keep him from doing what he's getting ready to do. And so, Lord, we announce again today America has been reset. Jubilee reset. Not because of anything of us or who we are, but because of the appeal. Because we appeal to a merciful God who keeps covenant in mercy to a thousand generations. We put ourselves under the mercy seat where the blood of the Lamb has been sprinkled. And our faith is in the blood of Christ himself. And you have come and you have rescued us And you've reconnected us to covenant. And we'll 
We're going to move again in that purpose, destiny. The gospel of the kingdom will go forth from these shores to all the nations of the earth. The gospel of the king and his kingdom and his rule and his deliverance and his salvation and his mighty power and authority and his heart to heal even parts of the planet bound by poverty and death and destruction will be delivered from false gods and from oppression and places that have been under the domination of the fall for thousands of years will be liberated in this hour. And angels are being released throughout the nations to serve his vision and his plan. And Lord, we, we just decree now once again the reset. We say reset will rule Tuesday. And reset will come to Washington. Reset is coming to the Congress and the Senate. And the reset that has begun at the court is not finished. But reset is coming to the streets of America. Reset is coming to the schools of America, to the campuses of America, to the inner cities of America. The wind, Holy Spirit, the wind is about to blow. From the four winds, <laughs> breath is coming to the planet. I just say now, America, hear the word of the Lord. Your salvation is coming to you now. Your Savior is coming to you. Your deliverer is coming. You will return to the ancient markers and the old road. And you will once again walk that road with the lover of your soul. Why don't you just say his name for a minute or two? Why don't you just call him everything you can think of that describes who he is? Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. You who speak in your voice is like the sound of many waters. 
Your eyes blaze with fire. You're the lamb, but you're the lion. You're the savior, you're the redeemer. You're the Lord, you're the master, you're creator, you're restorer, you're healer, you're the bomb of Gilead. You're the lover. Come on, call his name, Jesus, Messiah, Yeshua, Almighty God.